Hello, this is Jerry Morton. Welcome to my Finding My Way podcast. This is podcast number 52, titled 0800. Podcast 34 through 61 are stories from the year of Army training I experienced. The training started in August 1966 and ended in June 1967. The stories are published in the book, Reluctant Lieutenant, from Basic to OCS in the 60s, which was published by Texas A&M University Press as a military history. 0800 is an account of infantry OCS in the spring of 1967. Jerry is caught polishing his shoes during study hall time. He is required to produce a military letter under seemingly impossible conditions. It is recommended that you listen to the Army training stories in the order in which the podcast numbers present them so that you can appreciate the full contextual richness of this and later stories. 0800 Candidate, you're not studying, said a soft voice coming from the entrance to my cubicle. My stomach touched the roof of my mouth. How had the tack gotten here? I had not heard the bay doors open. How can I have been so careless? I had slipped up big time. Jumping out of my chair and knocking the shoe polished can to the floor, I braced to attention. Sir, yes, sir, I responded. The shoe polished can continued to roll across the floor. I want... A single-spaced, typed, two-page military letter on my desk by 0800 hours. It will address the importance of studying during the designated time. Do you understand? Sir! Yes, sir! He quietly moved on down the bay with more than a hint of smugness in his swagger. Well, at least my loud responses had alerted the others to his presence. Hell, I've gone and done it to myself, I thought. What is a military letter? A few of the guys had been assigned them, but none from within my immediate circle of friends. Not only was I in the dark about the nature of a military letter... I was also clueless as to how I could get a typewriter. Nobody had a typewriter. Hell, one would never fit in a footlocker. I would have known if someone had one of them. It would have been obvious and completely unmilitary. A guy would have had to dump it his first day here. There were no typewriters. Even if I had access to a typewriter, there was no time to get a military done before lights out or after lights on in the morning. We had slightly more than just an hour before lights out as it was. All of that time was needed to get ready for the morning inspection. In the morning, you barely had time to dress, shave, pee, and make it to the chow line before morning formation. After that, we marched, ran, or were trucked off for a full day's worth of training. There simply was no time to write, let alone type, a military letter. On top of that, the tax first floor office was locked at night. The door was not opened until 0800 hours. The whole thing was impossible. I was stressed. The others had done it. There had to be a way. The last two thoughts kept me from totally losing my cool. As soon as study time was over, several of the guys converged on my cubicle. 
I blurted out my brief story and told them about the impossible task I had been given. Ah, oh, not to worry, Mel said. A couple of the guys in the front cubicles have been experts at pulling this off. He went on to explain that they had acquired a key to that tax office. After lights out, they would sneak down, open his office, get the typewriter off of his desk, and bring it here. After I had the letter typed, they would smuggle the typewriter and my letter back to his office, lock the door, and everyone would be happy. They would even explain how to compose a military letter since they had already acquired the skill. Being, being one of the closest to the bay doors, they, they learned to do this fairly early in the program, he said laughing. Nate volunteered to hold a flashlight for me while I typed. He was a good cubicle mate. Our other cubicle partner would keep his eyes glued on the sentinels posted near the bay doors. If they signaled that the OD was coming, he would relay the message instantly. Theoretically, the three of us would have enough time to douse the light, hide the typewriter under the bottom bunk, and get back into our racks before the OD made it to our cubicle. It seemed like a workable plan, it was the only plan. I was amazed at how quickly they had developed a solution to the problem. It was obvious that I had been ignorant of a lot that had been going on around me. These guys were resourceful. Lights out! came the cry. We jumped into bed as darkness fell with a flip of a switch. The street lights outside provided just enough illumination for us to move around without bumping into things. Of course, the stairwell light and the latrine lights shining through the bay doors made it relatively bright for the first few cubicles. After a short hour of silence, I heard the bay doors squeak open and swish shut. It had begun. Someone was sneaking down to the first floor. He or they would unlock the tax door and whisk the typewriter up here. God, I hope they did not get caught. I would feel terrible if that happened. Fifteen minutes later, the bay door squeaked again. A shadowy figure scurried hunchback down the aisle. His white T-shirt and boxer shorts stood out in the darkness. Here you are. Let me know when you're ready for us to take it back, he said, setting the typewriter on the bottom bunk, Nate's bunk. He had also swiped some typing paper and correction fluid. These guys were really good. Thanks, I whispered. You've saved my life in Vietnam. He chuckled, slapped me on the back, and disappeared into the darkness. Nate held the flashlight as I wrote my draft in pencil. We moved as one to the typewriter. I had taken typing in seventh grade. That was a long time ago. It was painful for me to type. So another candidate typed for me. It took several tries before we achieved perfection. By definition, a military letter has no mistakes. At last it was done. The hour had gone quickly. I sneaked the typewriter and letter up to the front of the bay. The lookout saw me coming. We spoke in hushed voices. They said they would handle it from there. I started to thank them, but they motioned that there was no time. As they headed for the stairs, I returned to my bunk. Sleep came quickly. In the morning, the lookout said all had gone well. The tack never said a word to me about the letter, so I guess all did go well. There was a nagging problem, however. 
which kept me thinking about the whole process. The tack knew that it was impossible for me to get the letter on his desk without breaking a hell of a lot of rules. Why did they force us to be dishonest? It did not make sense. They had drilled into us that officers never tell lies. Why were they forcing us into dishonest behavior? Apparently, this had been going on for some time. Another question was how those guys had gotten hold of the TAC officer's keys. They had to be part of a pretty elaborate underground group that went beyond just our platoon. How did this group do all of the work that I was doing to pass inspection and have the extra time to play these games? Things just did not make sense to me. Something was wrong with this picture. Following the rules did not get you into the inner circle and it was clear that there was an inner circle. I was glad to be outside of the loop. All I wanted was to get through. Hope was still in my heart that I could get into the Medical Service Corps. All I needed to do was to let them know I was here. That was my heart doing the thinking, not my head. It was pretty clear that the spirit of the bayonet would prevail. None of us were getting out of infantry.